And before we get started, I would like for us to take a moment and pray for Art Chalicom. Uh, for those of you who know Art, uh, he is Yvette's uh, husband, but he's also the uh, deputy director for the planning, Department of Planning and Permitting and was a huge help to us in getting our building permit. Well, we learned today that he was rushed to uh, the emergency room at Straub Hospital and at six o'clock uh, went into a three hour emergency colon surgery. I talked with Yvette and the concern is for the health of the tissue uh, in the uh, surgery. So what I'd like to do, if you would join with me, is just pray for a successful surgery and a complete recovery. So let's pray for Art. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you that we can come to you as the great physician and petition your throne at times like this. And we want to petition your throne on behalf of Art and ask that you would just guide the hands of the physicians during the surgery, that the surgery would be a complete success, that the tissue would be okay, that everything would go well, and that the surgery will be complete and we'll have a good report to come as well. Lord, we thank you for Art, we thank you for Yvette. We pray your blessing on him on them during this time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get into our study. Second Kings, we left off a couple of weeks ago in chapter 19. Tonight we're going to take and tackle two chapters, chapter 20 and 21. So uh, before we jump in, let's uh, again ask God's blessing on our time in his word, and uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We love your word. We love you. And we love our time that we have together here during our Thursday night midweek Bible study. And so, Lord, we're wanting to ask you to bless our time in your word and speak clearly in and through your word into our lives, especially with this study that we have before us as we look at Hezekiah and his son and his son's son and uh, what they did, the evil that they did in your sight, and that, Lord, we would learn from it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall, verse 2, and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I walk before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight, and Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened, verse 4, before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, verse 7, take a lump of figs. So they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me? and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day. Then Isaiah said, verse 9, This is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees, or go backward ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is an easy thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward ten degrees. So 
Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. A couple thoughts here as we begin this most interesting chapter, and it is an interesting chapter. It's one that I've actually been anticipating uh, for some uh, time now. The, the first thing is uh, and has to do with the reasons as to why it is that God in his grace extends Hezekiah's years and miraculously heals him. One of the reasons I believe that God does this is because it's for the sake of his servant David, as he mentions, but moreover, it's for the sake of his people Israel, who still face threats from Assyria, a very present and real threat. Another reason is because Hezekiah simply and humbly and genuinely prayed and cried out to the Lord. However, that doesn't mean that God answered his prayer because he was a good king, as he mentions, who, who merited it. And as he prays in verse 3, that's not why God does it. God simply heard his prayer and, and hearkened unto the voice of his cry. And this actually ties in to the second thought, which is that Hezekiah's prayer was, if you think about it, in accordance with the will of God. We know that if we ask anything according to God's will, we can have that which we ask for. Now, think about this. It's thought that Hezekiah was about 39 years old when this happened. That's pretty young. Uh, this is when he learned uh, that of this, and he had the benefit of knowing that he was about to die. Not everybody knows when they're about to die, but God, through the prophet Isaiah, tells him that this is it. Get your affairs in order. How, how devastating would that be, and how devastating was that to him? But uh, his prayer was, in effect, Lord, I'm, I'm too young. <laughs> I still have a work to do. Please grant me more time is basically what he was praying. And again, this was in accordance with God's will. But here's what's really sad. It would prove to be the very thing, these 15 years that he would be extended, would prove to be the very thing that leads to his downfall during, uh, due to his pride during that time. He became very proud, and of course, pride always precedes the fall. Before we move on, it should be noted that Isaiah 38, the whole chapter actually, provides us with more details of this account, and it's specifically as it relates to that which Hezekiah prayed. I just want to read verses 9 and 10. It says, This is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. I said, verse 10, listen to this, in the prime of my life, shall I go to the gates of Sheol? Am I deprived of the remainder of my years? So he's 39, God gives him 15 more years, and sadly, uh, he, <laughs> he does not do well those last 15 years, as we're about to see. Verse 12, at that time, Baradach Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah, verse 13, was attentive to them and showed them all the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah verse 14, the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say? And from where did they come to you? Isaiah knows. So Hezekiah said, they came from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, verse 15, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing, and listen to this, 
among my treasures, my treasures, that I have not shown them. Well, what Hezekiah does here is the very thing that leads to his downfall. I suppose you could say that this is, again, a textbook case of pride coming before the fall, as it always does. The fact of the matter is, Hezekiah is taking all the credit for everything that God has done. He's, he's taking the glory for himself, for what God did, and it's evidenced by him saying, my house and my treasures. Listen, I, I tell you, when I, whenever I prepare for a teaching, and I really love so very much the Old Testament, and it's in some ways a, a highlight of my week. Don't get me wrong, I love, of course, the New Testament, and I, and I of course, love Bible prophecy, but there's just such a, a richness in, in the Old Testament. And when, when you have these character studies and you learn from these kings, and, and especially a king like Hezekiah, the Lord searches me. And I know the Lord searches you too, but it can be so subtle and that's the thing about pride it can just be so subtle my house my treasures i have to be careful even calling it my church <laughs> actually it's god's church and i just have the privilege of being the pastor of this god's church i mean i know that when i say my church i mean i don't mean it's my look at this great church that my hands have built <laughs> just ask nebuchadnezzar how that worked out for him <laughs> look at this mighty babylon that my hands have built and he spent the next seven years living like an animal well we have to be careful i think when it comes to pride because it is so subtle and it can creep in ever so slowly and, and even unnoticeably. And it seems that Hezekiah here is so given over to pride that he's unwilling to even share in God's glory. There's no mention that of God anywhere in this. Everything's about him. And even sharing God's glory in and of itself is just as sinful as taking all the glory. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, share with another, neither my praise to graven images. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 29, it says, no flesh should glory in his presence. I'm reminded in the instructions for the service there in the tabernacle, the priest could not wear any garments that would show the flesh. That's why they had to wear these long robes so that it covered the flesh. So when they stepped up to the altar, you don't see any flesh. You don't see any flesh. And moreover, they had to wear garments that did not create sweat because sweat was a sort of a, a picture of the flesh. One of the things that I, I found myself this last week as it relates to our building project praying is that I don't want my sweat to be anywhere on this building project. I don't want m the energy of my own flesh to be found anywhere in this building project when it's all said and done. I don't want to stand before God's people and say, wow, look at, you know, <laughs> what we did. Well, we didn't do it. This building is going to get built and renovated, and it's going to be a nice church building because God did it. God did it, and God alone gets the glory. But here's the thing. The problem comes when one is fully given over to pride that the result is this glorying in his presence. I mean, we're, we're careful and even noble about how we do it, but, you know, in our heart, there's this notion that we had something to do with it. 
we had something to do with it. Oh, we, oh, we give the glory to God, praise the Lord, but, you know, deep down inside, we're, we're still, and the Lord knows our heart. Of Hezekiah being given over to pride, one commentator said it best this way. He said, it was not spiritual pride, as with his great-grandfather Uzziah, who forced his way into the Holy of Holies, and then God struck him with leprosy. And, and, and kings don't do that. Only priests could do that. That's, that's spiritual pride. And that was his great-grandfather, Uzziah. But it was worldly pride, the pride of life, we might say. It was his precious things, his armor, his treasures, his house, his dominion, etc., that he showed the ambassadors from Babylon the question becomes one of why. I always like to ask the why question, the why behind the what. Why Hezekiah fell to the temptation of pride? He has just been the recipient of God's amazing grace, if I can say it that way. He was a breath away from death. He was on his deathbed. And God, in His grace and mercy, extends His life 15 years. You would think that His response would be one of humility, realizing the temporal nature and the brevity of life. His, the very breath of man is held in the hand of God. And God alone can give life and take life. And God in that moment could have taken his life, but he doesn't. You would think that would do something to him. That it would be humility <laughs> that would be his response, but it's not. It's pride. And here he receives this letter. It's not the first time he receives a letter. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But he receives this letter from Babylon, and I think he's flattered. Oh, the Babylon is sending me an email. <laughs> Babylon is reaching out to me. I think it made him a little bit heady. It's interesting to note that when he received the threatening letter, remember, from the Rabshakeh prior, his response when he received that letter was to immediately Seek the Lord in prayer. And now, conspicuously absent with this letter is any mention of Hezekiah doing that. And instead, we're told he was attentive to them. He, he gave them his undivided attention, his full attention in response. Charles Spurgeon of this says, Hezekiah, though but a little prince, suddenly found himself a wealthy man, having moreover one thing in his treasury, treasury which could not have been discovered among the riches of any other living man, namely, a writ from the court of heaven that he should live 15 years. This great prosperity was a great temptation far more difficult to endure than Rabshakeh's letter and all the ills which invasion brought upon the land. G. Campbell Morgan answers another question that I think comes up. What was the motivation on the part of the Babylonians in the first place to send Hezekiah this letter? Who's he? G. Campbell Morgan has some interesting insight. He says, the real reason of the visit was political. Babylon desired to throw off the yoke of Assyria. Oh, what nation was more likely to help them than the one at the hands of which Assyria had been so completely defeated? Babylon sought alliance with Judah against Assyria for that reason. Well, <laughs> why was Assyria defeated? Because of God? It wasn't Israel. It wasn't Judah. It wasn't King Hezekiah. It was only because God granted them the victory. I can't help but think how Hezekiah must have felt 
when Babylon seeks him out to form this alliance. I mean, of course. This is a no-brainer. Again, it probably explains why it is that he doesn't seek the Lord. Of course, this must be God. Because it is an alliance against Assyria, whom God has allowed me to live to defeat. We have to be oh so careful when we manufacture scenarios that appear to be the will of God. I mean, isn't that why God allowed me to live for 15 more years? And then he said, God must be in this. I, maybe he thought God moved Babylon to send him this letter to form this alliance for the sole purpose of defeating Assyria. The problem with that, and there is a problem with that, is that Hezekiah fancied himself as being more important than he was. He thought more highly of himself than he ought, and perhaps we need look no further than to his desire to impress and please man. I see Hezekiah in the last years of his life being a man pleaser more than a God pleaser. And certainly he sought to impress Babylon and, and as a result of his God-given success he boasts in it, glories in it. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the most dang dangerous temptations when it comes to pride, it would have to be success. I have a book in my library. It's many, many years old. And it was from back when I was in the business world and had my own, my own business. And it's called The Agony of Affluence. The Agony of Affluence. The title says it all, doesn't it? The Agony of Affluence. Listen, when adversity strikes, we, we get pretty godly, don't we? <laughs> we get pretty humble, don't we? We get pretty dependent on the Lord, don't we? But boy, when we're prosperous and God's blessing us and things are going well, we tend to sort of rely on ourselves. We tend to take the credit ourselves. It, it goes to our head. It puffs us up. We become full of ourselves. So much so that the greatest and godliest of men have fallen because of the very success that God himself had given them to begin with. One of the things that I have to be oh so careful with in my own life is this area of pride. And it's in the pastorate. The pastor isn't exempt. <laughs> In fact, if anything, it's, it's almost worse. Because, you know, God starts blessing the ministry. God starts blessing the church. You get your own building, <laughs> 3.1 acres, beautiful property. And there's the enemy right there trying to insinuate that you somehow are special. Oh, sure, God gets all the glory, but surely God looked down on you and said, that's my man. I think nothing could be further from the truth. We have to guard against pride. I've likened it to a virus, a computer virus. And th these computer viruses now are so sophisticated and so complex and so destructive that they actually can disable your antivirus software. They, they actually disable, they, they write the, the code in this virus. So all it has to do is once it's on your computer, it disables all the firewalls, all the antivirus, and then whew, that's it. You're done. And you don't know it's there until it's too late. And is that not an apt description of pride? It disables that anti-pride software, if you will. 
that detects it and quarantines it and deals with it and protects your computer from it, it, it disables it. And we become disabled and then pride just begins its destructive course in the computer of our lives. And it's not long before there's a complete and total crash. And that's why pride always precedes the crash or the fall. And such is the case here with Hezekiah. God had given him health and wealth, prosperity and property, and it was all for his glory. <laughs> and Hezekiah wastes all of it. At the end of his life, he wastes all of it. Second Chronicles fills in some of the details. Chapter 32, let me read verses 24 through 29. In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him. And we're going to hear why. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. Then... Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. We're going to see that towards the end of the chapter. Hezekiah had very great riches and honor. He had made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stone, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items, storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kinds of livestock, and foals for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him. Let me read that again. God had given him. <laughs> this was all a gift from the hand of God. The blessing from the hand of God. God had given him very much property. And what did he do? His heart was lifted up. He did not repay according to the favor shown him. You know, in Proverbs, it, it's always ah, difficult when you, when you read those Proverbs that describe God resisting the proud. You get this picture in your mind of God just saying, get away from me. Get away from me. I can't. I can't even be around you when you're full of pride and full of yourself like that. He resists the proud. Listen, I, I got enough in my life resisting me. I got enough in my life against me. The last person I want is my God resisting me. If, listen, if God is resisting me, shoot me now. I, I'm done. I'm toast. And yet we read that God resists the proud, but, and this is one of those buts that you just think, yes, Lord, but what? But he gives grace, grace to the humble. Verse 16, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, and here it comes, the other shoe's going to drop, as they say. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they, verse 18, shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, verse 19, and don't misunderstand what he's saying here. The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. What? What do you mean? For he said, and here, here it is, Will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he made a pool and a tunnel, remember the tunnel? And brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Hezekiah, verse 21, rested with his fathers. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be introduced to Manasseh here in a moment. But 
This prophecy concerning the Babylonian captivity would be fulfilled some 100 years later. And oh, by the way, uh, as a result of that, Daniel and his fellow Hebrews that would have their names changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be amongst those taken into slavery. Here again we have a chapter that ends with yet another bad end of a good king. And he would be known throughout history <clears throat> for the tunnel he built. It is really quite a remarkable tunnel. For those of you who went to Israel with us, uh, we went through that tunnel. Did you go through the wet part? You did, right? Yeah. You're good for you. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm getting too old for that. I just I went through the dry part. But anyway, fascinating. But that's Hezekiah's tunnel that he built, and it's recorded throughout history. Well, let's get to chapter 21, and let's introduce ourselves to this Manasseh, not our friend, not a good guy. <laughs> Interesting, he was 12 years old, 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. That's a long time. His mother's name was Hephzibah, and verse 2, he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he, verse 3, rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. Are you kidding me? He raised up altars for Baal and made a woman, wooden image as Ahab. Remember Ahab? king of Israel had done, and he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He also built altars, verse 4, in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had, he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, in Jerusalem will, I will put my name. This is one of those places where we read that God himself has literally put his name of ownership on Jerusalem. Would somebody please tell my people, the Arab people, that God put his name there and it belongs to his people, Israel? And it's literally his name. We've looked at it, the Sheen, and how the old city is, if you were to trace the wall of the old city, it is in the shape of the Sheen, which was an abbreviation for the name of God himself. In other words, God literally put his name there. And verse 5, he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, if you can imagine this, he made his son pass through the fire, human sacrifice. This is Molech. Remember Molech? The statue, iron statue with the arms and the fire in the belly. That's where we get that expression. And they would sacrifice their children burning them alive in the fire. Practice soothsaying. Used witchcraft. You, know, you, you would think it couldn't get any worse. And consulted spiritists and mediums. And by the way, he did this in the house of the Lord. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image, verse 7, of Asherah that he had made in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. There it is again. And what's it, what does he do? He puts a pornographic image in the house of the Lord. That's what Asherah was, a sex goddess. This was a porn pornography, a pornographic image in the house of God. And God says, this is the place I have chosen out of all of the tribes to put my name. And you put that there? And I, verse 8, will not make the feet of Israel wander anymore from the land which I gave their fathers, only if they are... This was the condition, careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But, and verse 9 should be written indelibly on our tablets, the tablets of our heart and our mind, 
they paid no attention. Is that not an apt description of our world today? They pay no attention. They paid no attention. And this is interesting. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Did you catch that? They did more evil than the nations around them did. Think about that. That's evil. More evil than the nations around them. There's something really interesting here I want to point out, and it has to do with Manasseh's age when he became king. Now th think this through with me and do the math. We're told, this is Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, okay? He's 12 years old when he becomes king. Wait a minute. Hezekiah was given 15 more years, right? So if my math is right, then this bad son comes from a good father at the end of his life, basically three years into the 15 years that God had given him, if my math is right. Because after Hezekiah died, 15 years later, and he was made king at age 12, then that means that three years into the 15 years, Manasseh was born. For 12 years, he watched his father cower to the Babylonians. He watched his father, who had been given that 15 years by the grace and mercy of God, become puffed up with pride. That's the fa only father he knew. That's the only Hezekiah, his father, that he knew for the first 12 years of his life, which were the last 12 years of Hezekiah's life. That's very sobering, especially as a father. It doesn't mean that you put it all on, on Hezekiah. Certainly the sons are responsible there's no such thing as the curse of the, the generational curse, the sins of the father. That, that is not biblical. We've talked about that on numerous occasions. But it does imply that the role of a father can never be underestimated as it relates to the influence that they have on their son. I'm not again assigning all the blame to Hezekiah, but it is interesting to me that these were the last years of Hezekiah's life and he has this son who would be amongst the most evil kings in all of Israel's history. It's interesting. We're going to see an ironic twist uh, in this in a moment. And the Lord spoke, verse 10, by his servants, the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him, and has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. Whoa! It's going to be so catastrophic. The judgment that is meted out is going to be such a calamity, it's going to make people who hear about it, it's going to make their ears ring. That's pretty bad. And verse 13, I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. You get the impression that God is angry. <laughs> So, verse 14, I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become victims of plunder to all their enemies. And here's why, verse 15, because they have done evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. Moreover, verse 16, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood, and by the way, you know how God sees the shedding of innocent blood. 
We've, we've seen how serious God takes the shedding of innocent blood. Well, he had shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another besides his sin by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. In other words, in addition <laughs> to all the evil. Now, verse 17, the rest of the acts of Manasseh, all that he did and the sin that he committed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Manasseh, Manasseh rested with his father's good riddance and was buried in the garden of his own house in the garden of Uzzah. Then his son Ammon reigned in his place. What's interesting about what we're told here in the narrative is that no one takes a stand against this evil king. Why do I mention that? Because it would seem to indicate that the Israelites were willing participants. They were willing participants in this unspeakable evil imposed upon them by a seductive Manasseh. I can't get over how we're told that he seduced them to do evil. Keep in mind, evil seductive. It, temptation to sin would not be a temptation to sin if it weren't a temptation. That didn't quite work, sound right. In other words, there's no temptation if it doesn't look delicious. The fruit that God said, of all the trees in the garden you can eat, but this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what do we read of Eve? She looked upon it, and it looked delicious, enticing, and she was seduced by the serpent. Evil is seductive. One of the things I think that we do err greatly in is that we... We don't paint sin on the canvas of how good it looks. The Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season, but in the end, <laughs> it brings such bitter fruit. But I, I, I'm, I'm sort of taken back by how none of the Israelites are even balking there's, not, there's no mention of anyone taking a stand and saying this is evil in the sight of the Lord and the judgment of God is going to come down on Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria because of it. What are you doing? But no one. No mention of it. And again, I think this is an apt description of where we're at today. There's, the voice has been muted. The voice has been muted. But it's like evil prospers unchecked. Unchecked. You read of the world waxing more evil seemingly by the day in these last of days and you ask yourself, won't anybody put a stop to it? Well, one will. One will. There is coming a day when the judgment of God will come upon this world. And soon, and very soon, I believe. But to me, this would explain why it is that God meets out such a harsh judgment. And it's upon all of Jerusalem, Judea, and even to Samaria. And the imagery is pretty intense. Wouldn't you agree? I'm going to wipe Jerusalem like you wipe a dish. And he does. When we get to Second Chronicles 33, we're going to learn of Manasseh's repentance. This guy actually repents. And he's going to try now, once he repents, to undo all the evil he had done. That's quite a, a, a tall order. Because what, didn't we just get done reading quite a long list of all the evil that he did? Oh, li listen to how the Lord got his attention. Verse 10, 2 Chronicles 33, And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and, and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria. Oh. 
who took Manasseh with hooks. Remember this? We talked about this, what the Assyrians would do. They were merciless and evil through and through. They would impale the Israelites with these hooks in their face, in their nose, in their mouth, and they would drag them like meat. And, they, and here's the thing. They were so evil, they would prey upon the elderly and the infirmed and the children. They were an easy prey. And that's what they would do to them. And God allowed them to do that to, of all people, this evil king Manasseh. They took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now, verse 12, and this is interesting, when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him and received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Would to God that he does not ever have to resort to these drastic measures to get our attention to repent. But I, I want to be, I never want to get to that place where God has to bring the Assyrians to impale me with a hook and drag me into captivity before I humble myself before God and pray and repent. But that's what it took for Manasseh. And to his credit, he does. And he knew that the Lord was God. After this, he built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley as far as the entrance of the fish gate, and it enclosed a fell, and he raised it to a very great height. Again, he's going to try to undo everything. Then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. He took away the foreign gods. Get them out of here. Oh, my goodness. And the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he cast them out of the city. I, I, he couldn't do it fast enough. You almost uh, get the impression. He also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank off offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> wow, the Lord really got a hold of this guy. Nevertheless, I don't like this nevertheless. The people still sacrifice in the high places, but only to the Lord their God. This was true worship in a false way. <laughs> now, the rest of the Acts of Manasseh, his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, indeed they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. Verse 19, Ammon, this is his son, was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulemeth, the daughter of Haruz of Jatbah, and he did evil on the side of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. So he walked in all the ways that his father had walked, and he served the idols that his father had served and worshipped them. He forsook the Lord God of his fathers and did not walk in the way of the Lord. Then the servants of Ammon conspired against him, and he and killed the king in his own house. But the people of the land executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon, then the people of the land made his son Josiah, Josiah, king in his place. Now, the rest of the acts of Ammon, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of King of Judah? And he was buried in his tomb in the garden of Uzzah. Then Josiah, his son, reigned in his place, not a moment too soon. In fact, the only thing good that came from this evil Ammon was his son Josiah, who would be one of the greatest kings of, in all of Israel. Well, sadly, this Ammon, his life was an evil one, and it's basically summed up, and I want to end with this one verse in Second Chronicles concerning him sinning more and more 
more and more. I'm sorry to end on, a, on such a note, but listen to this, because I think it just sums everything up that we've seen here tonight in God's Word concerning pride. Listen to what it says of his life. And he did not humble himself before the Lord. He did not humble himself before the Lord, as his father Manasseh had humbled himself. And then we read this of Ammon. He trespassed more and more, exceedingly more, continually. He sinned more and more. And that's what we read of his life. Oh, boy, wouldn't you? I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine. If he had a tombstone, that's what it would say. Here lies Ammon, who did not humble himself before the Lord. Instead, he trespassed more and more. That would be his, on his tombstone. That would, that's what could be said of his life. All because the, the trespassing more and more came because he did not humble himself. I would suggest that had he humbled himself before the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done, we would not read that he trespassed more and more. He would have gotten right with God and pleased God more and more instead. Why don't you all stand? We'll pray. Oh, Lord. <sighs> Tough stuff in your word tonight but oh how needed it is a reminder to us of the seriousness and the subtlety of pride the destruction that pride always brings the fall that always ensues Lord we want to learn from your word we want to take heed to your word that we would not ever repeat this folly that what we've read about these evil men in your word tonight would never be mentioned about us Lord we want to live lives that are pleasing to you as we humble ourselves before you in Jesus name Amen